Today, uh, we have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Cassia Rettner from the University of York. Uh, she's going to talk about gauge invariant observables in perturbative algebraic QFT. Cassia, whenever you want, for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this nice meeting and uh, well, for the effort of organizing this event and bring us all together. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, which is observables. And um, I guess it might be a bit uh, exotic for some of you. There's not going to be uh, that much quantum information theory, but uh, there will be some uh, context I hope that could be useful uh, for you guys. So uh, yeah, just a brief recap of uh, algebraic quantum field theory and perturbative algebraic quantum field theory. Some of these things were already mentioned somehow uh, as you know, operator algebraic approach to quantum field theory, but it doesn't uh, hurt to remind people. Um, so first of all, uh, where, where things start, let's say, is trying to study algebraic quantum field theory on curved space time. And well, QFT on curved space time is, uh, well, very different from uh, QFT on Minkowski. There are uh, various difficulties that arise. And the approach I follow uh, is the one of um, algebraic quantum field theory. And here, I'd like to mention some people who uh, made that happen. So Hollands and Wald, Brunetti, Fren, Hagen, and Fesch, and Fuster Fesch. So these are some seminal papers that uh, build the foundations of the subject. Uh, and well, the idea was to generalize the original algebraic quantum field theory framework uh, developed by Hack, Kassler, and Araki to study uh, QFT on space terms more interesting than Minkowski. Uh, but the idea is very similar to the original setting. So uh, one tries to encode physical information about the quantum system. Uh, in specifying algebras assigned to regions. So one considers open regions of space time that have to be in some way bounded. So one says relatively compact and one assigns to them algebras of, uh, well, we say observables, but actually uh, one can think of these more like perturbations of uh, the system. Uh, and well, there's going to be a talk by Chris Fuster later this week, uh, where he will talk a bit more about how things can actually be observed uh, in this framework. But yeah, so the main idea uh, is, uh, well, summarized as follows. So here is this uh, like one region of a space time sitting in like a larger region, uh, and then we assign to it an algebra of let's call it for now observables. Okay, um, now why should we care? Why is this a good idea? Well, here these algebras are defined rather abstractly, so we can study the observables uh, before we specify a concrete Hilbert space representation. So we separate these two problems, construction of observables from particular construction of a state. And in quantum field theory, there are many interesting states, especially in curved space time, there might be many states of interest. So on Minkowski is usually the vacuum, but there are also thermal states, and these are also of interest. So having the flexibility to specify states uh, is quite good. Okay, so now there's the perturbative story because uh, quantum field theory is uh, very complex, and it turns out that constructing interacting models there is rather hard. People have not managed to construct interacting models non-perturbatively in four dimensions. So the interesting physics we uh, observe in, say, particle physics accelerators uh, is something which is not covered by non-perturbative methods. Um, at least from you know, rigorous mathematical viewpoint. Uh, so this was the motivation for developing perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, uh, where we kind of accept the fact that we have to work with formal power series and compute um, 
quantum corrections to various processes by expanding things in H bar and don't worry about things not converging. So mathematically, we say we work with formal power series. And again, I want to mention some people who made that happen. So uh, there was the story of deformation quantization that's used to construct uh, the free theory. So this goes back to Dutchman, Hagen, and Brunetti in various combinations of these names. And uh, well, the, the key thing about introducing the interaction and how to study interaction in that approach uh, that actually goes back to uh, works of Epstein and Glaser uh, and their approach to renormalization that was actually developed already in the 70s. Um, and finally, what is most interesting to me personally is uh, gauge theories and also effective uh, gravity, uh, which is something which uses some methods of homological algebra and it's much newer in that approach. So the first work uh, was due to uh, Stefan Holland, and then there was a generalization by Klaus Friend Hagen and myself. So um, these theories uh, introduce new uh, challenges, but also new opportunities. Uh, finally, let me do a bit of advertising. So if you're interested in this approach, I wrote a book about it. Uh, it's aimed at mathematically minded people, uh, but I hope that it's at least uh, readable, uh, we shall see. Um, and anyway, I would be happy to discuss it if anybody happens to be uh, in Waterloo this week. All right, uh, so now the main thing I want to talk about is how we think about quantum observables. Uh, so the main message here is that in this framework of PQFT, we have this machinery to turn classical observables into quantum observables. And it's kind of, well, universal in that we can apply it on arbitrary space times and with arbitrary states in mind. So uh, it's really a powerful machinery for computing quantum things out of classical things. Uh, so the aim of more general program here is to study uh, observables in gauge theories and uh, quantum gravity using these methods as long as, well, you know, we can study things that are actually accessible to uh, perturbative methods. And we want to find out what sort of algebraic structures they, they define. Uh, and for the purpose of uh, this talk, uh, in this meeting, I would like to uh, well, focus on the idea of relational observables and how this can maybe uh, connect it to the notion of quantum reference frames. So I believe that uh, using this approach to defining relational observables, maybe one can uh, make a connection with the existing work in um, our QI community on quantum reference frames. So let me tell you a bit more about those. Uh, so relational observables. And as I mentioned, everything starts classical and then it goes into quantum by applying you know, our standard machinery. So let me start with classical uh, relational observables. Okay, um, so I'm thinking, uh, well, quantum gravity, this is my main motivation here. So, uh, well, we have here a situation where we have gravity uh, coupled to some matter fields and both uh, the gravitational field and matter are going to be quantized. Uh, and because, you know, I want to simplify things notationally, um, I will denote the metric by G and all the other fields collectively by phi. And that couple of things, so metric plus matter, is going to be um, denoted by gamma. Okay, so now uh, I want to see, well, maybe these scalar fields or maybe some curvature scalars as um, coordinates. So this is, uh, well, maybe the idea of reference frame comes in. So I want to think of things relationally. So if I'm trying to, uh, you know, 
perform an actual experiment and measure things, in practice, it happens in relation to something. And well, maybe the difference here uh, to how unusually things about stuff is that everything is part of the system. So uh, everything is dynamical. So uh, say what I'm observing is dynamical, but also um, the coordinate system is dynamical. So I pick four scalars. As I said, this could be matter fields or these could be constructed out of the metric. And I use them to parameterize points in space then. Uh, and as such, uh, you know, these are scalars. Uh, I know how they are going to transform under deformorphism. So if I relabel uh, points of space time by some deformorphism, uh, then this is what happens. So uh, each of these scalars depends on my field, so on gamma, right? So if I want to now transform everything by deformorphism, I relabel my points, then uh, what it does, I get again my four scalars, but then I had to uh, pull back those dynamical fields by that deformorphism. So this is the important formula. And one can think of this choice of coordinates here as a choice of an observer or a reference frame. And uh, there was also an interesting work uh, with a similar viewpoint on things uh, by Donnelly and Friedel, which also uses uh, a similar idea of a quantum observer. Okay, um, but now uh, in the end, I'm going to quantize things perturbatively. So I have to fix a background, which again consists background metric and background values of my uh, matter fields. And I want to fix a background such that uh, these coordinates for that background are good coordinate systems. So this map from the point of space time to the value of these four things uh, is injective. So then I can uh, invert that. And then I consider uh, perturbations of that. So I'm going to work perturbatively, um, but then uh, I don't want to go too far away from that background. So I'm looking at uh, well, small perturbations, so small fluctuations. Uh, and then I define the following object. So there is my coordinate system uh, given by gamma zero, so by my background fields. Uh, so I can go from space time to R4 with that. And then I can go back to uh, space time with appropriate sort of coordinate system transformation, uh, but now by the full sort of perturbed uh, field. And then I can look how, how this map, how this combination transforms under the form office. And here is the interesting thing. So again, when I apply DFO transformation to everyone, uh, what it does, uh, it acts with the inverse of that default morph is on the left. Uh, can do the calculation at home. Uh, and it's very useful. Uh, and this will allow me to construct nice uh, gauge invariant objects. So let's take, uh, Another field, let's take another uh, scalar, say uh, denoted by A gamma. Again, it depends on recall uh, the metric and the metric fields, and they compose it with this transformation alpha. So as a scalar, right, this guy uh, transforms under diffuse by acting with a phi, sorry, chi on the right. And this guy transforms by acting with chi to the minus one on the left. These things cancel out nicely. So this whole object, this combination of things is invariant under the form of it. This is all, you know, classical field theory. Nothing terrible happens. Uh, and if we want to go back to, well, what this actually means physically, well, as I said, these X uh, mu gammas are, uh, field-dependent coordinates. So taking 
this combination here corresponds to taking the value of the quantity A, provided that the quantity X has the fixed value, in this case, uh, Y. So it really does, uh, you know, capture the idea of a relational observable. Okay, and these are obviously known in uh, other approaches to quantum gravity. So here I want to mention works of uh, Bianca Dietrich, Christina Giese, uh, Carlo Velli, and Thomas Thiemann. So they all worked on things uh, related to that in various approaches to quantum gravity. Um, and uh, from these objects, from these deformorphism invariant observables, I can uh, construct uh, then uh, functionals of uh, the metric and um, the matter fields, which are given by integrating uh, these invariant combinations with some test functions. Uh, so if you then do a bit of coordinate change, uh, you can see here uh, the other way of uh, looking at this quantity is um, to evaluate, say, your, your physical quantity you want to observe at uh, the point given by your uh, coordinate, dynamical coordinate system, and then you evaluate the test function at the point given by the background value of your dynamical coordinate system. Uh, so again, physically looking at this object is uh, a sort of maybe a bit more clever version of looking at smeared observables in quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, we would consider th th things like that. These would be local observables uh, where the background uh, coordinates are fixed. So here we are looking at uh, a situation where, uh, you know, quantum gravity, obviously we expect that uh, the geometry is dynamical. So here uh, we really need to consider the usual quantum field theory observables, but evaluate it using dynamical coordinate systems. So you have to specify two things if you want to say uh, what observables you're talking about. Uh, you have to specify the actual like physical quantity you want to measure, say some curvature scalar A, but you also have to specify your coordinate system or uh, your observer X. So there are two pieces of data that have to be provided. And interestingly enough, uh, they can both be quantized together in a coherent way. Okay. Um, and well, needless to say, this object is non-local, um, but it's actually, uh, well, if both these things are uh, constructed locally, so if X and A are local functions of gamma, then it is non-local, but it's not badly non-local. So it can still be uh, quantized using methods of perturbative AQFT. Okay, so this is uh, the sort of theory behind things. And now let me say a few words about examples. So some of you heard that before. Um, so obviously we have uh, some curvature invariants. Uh, there are old works of Bergman and uh, Comer where similar things were studied. Um, there are dust fields in brown kuhash model, um, which are essentially for scalars coupled to the metric. Uh, and there is a cosmological example by uh, Brunetti, Frenhagen, uh, Hack, and Pinamonti, and myself. And finally, there are works of Marcus Frug, uh, where he also considers this kind of observables. So there is uh, some literature on that. Again, this is all more in the setting of uh, perturbative effective quantum gravity. So it would be interesting actually to look at these things more seriously from uh, you know, the quantum information angle and try to think about them as uh, some kind of quantum reference frames. But uh, this problem is a bit open. Okay. Uh, so that's the classical story. And in the remaining time, I want to give you an outline of 
uh, the quantum story. So I wanted to say the new stuff first, so the old stuff can be uh, uh, condensed. Uh, how much time do I have? Five, Five minutes. Why not? Perfect. OK, great. Um, so just to give you like a very brief sketch of uh, how this, you know, magic of quantization happens. So we start with a space time. We start with a uh, configuration space. So scalars, vectors, tensors, whatever you want to study. Um, and then, uh, well, here are the examples, right? So for the scalar fields, uh, smooth functions on your space time for young mills, we have uh, one forms valued in a Lie group and uh, well, metric perturbations for effective quantum gravity. Uh, dynamics is introduced using a uh, well, version of Lagrangian formalism. And observables are considered as functionals on the configuration space. So you have seen examples already. Um, and yeah, so the idea is that you start with constructing a covariant canonical bracket called the Paris bracket, which uses some uh, input from uh, PDE theory. So uh, you start with a theory where um, the free dynamics is given essentially in terms of a wave operator, that wave operator has nicely behaving green functions, uh, retarded and advanced green functions, and their difference uh, defines you a Poisson by vector uh, for the Poisson structure. So that's the classical theory. Then you deform it using the formation quantization. There's this uh, so called Moyal formula for uh, the star product. So this is um, kind of standard. Um, and the only thing that maybe is worth uh, pointing out is that uh, we work all the time in the same space of functions. So what we are changing, what we are deforming is actually the product structure, right? So we started with a pointwise product of, of functions, right? C-valued functions, and then uh, we deform it to something not commutative. But we stay with the same observables, we stay with the same functionals. So whatever we build in the classical theory, we can um, run away with it. Uh, Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's the classical theory, uh, quantization of uh, the free theory, goes through that deformation. Um, then, uh, yeah, so there are some choices that have to be made in that deformation, which correspond to a choice of a complex structure on the configuration space. This is a bit on the technical side of things. And finally, if you want to introduce the interaction, you want to uh, construct time-ordered products, which then sum up to the formal S matrix. And these formal S matrices are the main objects of our story. Again, everything goes by some sort of form of, of deformation quantization uh, in a loose sense. And in the middle of that, some renormalization has to happen. But this is all in the sort of, you know, black box you can call uh, PAQFT. Um, all right. But maybe one thing, again, worth pointing out for people who might be suspicious at this point that it works for perturbative quantum gravity. Uh, this approach to renormalization also works for uh, power counting non-renormalizable things. So that's why we can get away with stuff. Uh, okay, so there is a prescription for constructing interacting fields. Um, again, it's all sort of perturbative. So we start with linearizing theory and then introduce the interaction at the later stage. And we have states that are understood as functionals on our uh, space of observables. So uh, we have now our quantum algebra with the non commutative product we introduce, and the state is a map from that to uh, complex numbers. And then, if we want to go to Hilbert spaces that everybody uh, likes, we use the GNS theorem. Um, I see Eduardo, so I think I should be going towards conclusions. Uh, 
Yeah. So just to uh, wrap up, so this is the whole sort of framework that works for um, scalar fields, uh, gauge theories, and effective quantum gravity. So for studying things like I introduced in the first part of the talk, it's effective quantum gravity you're after. Um, there is a way to uh, extend the theory using some version of BRST, which is called BV formalism, so that you can quantize things nicely. And then uh, you uh, control symmetry invariance using uh, homological algebra. Okay, so uh, I guess what I want to uh, advertise a bit here is that uh, maybe there is a nice connection between uh, sort of effective quantum gravity observables like these relational observables and, uh, you know, taking seriously the idea of uh, quantum reference frames and uh, taking them to a bit of extreme situation where everything is dynamical. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. No Actually, one of the things that uh, uh, keep us, you know, like uh, uh, the Canadian, uh, Canadian, but they're not the ducks, but the Canadian geese would have been a choice, you know, for the UK and for, for Canada. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Just for the I wanted to advertise <laughs> York a bit. Well, I've seen some good ducks around, so. <laughs> nice, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so um, yeah, we have a question from Rob. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, hi. Yeah, it, what, uh, this is all for bosonic fields, is that correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I talk bosonic because I'm terrible with signs, but it works also for fermions. Okay, that was my question. Is this yeah. all carry through for fermions? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You have to, yeah, watch your signs, but yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that uh, when somebody asks me next time if it works for fermions, I'm gonna tell them, ah, you need to watch your science budget. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, I don't see any more hands. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to ask everybody to thank Cassie again. Thank you for the talk. It was great. Thank you, Cassie.